Hello, my name is Van de Keizer. I'm a neuroradiologist at the University Hospital of Ghent in Belgium. And this session is going to be about radiological anatomy of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a very small anatomical structure located medially in the temporal lobe, but despite its small size, a functionally very important structure as the hippocampus is responsible for, amongst other things, the consolidation and the formation of our long-term memories. Pathologically, it is often damaged in patients with chronic refractory epilepsy and is the cause of epilepsy in a lot of these patients. So the hippocampus is an important structure functionally, but also radiologically, as it can be involved in several pathological processes. Today, we're just going to talk about the normal radiological anatomy of the hippocampus, and hippocampal pathology will be addressed in future sessions. Let's start with the anatomy. The hippocampus is located in the temporal lobe. This is the temporal lobe. We have two of them, self-evidently. And the temporal lobe has two surfaces. It has a lateral surface, which consists of three gyri, and it has a basal surface, which consists of two gyri. And then we have the hippocampus sitting on top of the most medial basal temporal gyrus located at the innermost medial part of the temporal lobe. Let's look at this uh, temporal lobe anatomy in a little bit more detail. So let's start with the lateral surface. What do we have? And it's uh, pretty self-evident. We have on top the superior temporal gyrus, and if we look at the anatomy of the superior temporal gyrus, we see there is a knob here. You will always be able to discern that knob on coronal images and also on sagittal images. And what, what is that knob? That, that is Heschel's gyrus. Heschel's gyrus, or Brotman Area 41, is the primary auditory cortex. Underneath the superior temporal gyrus, we have the middle temporal gyrus, and then, all very self-evident and logical, the inferior temporal gyrus, which marks the transition from the lateral temporal lobe surface to the basal temporal lobe surface. In the basal temporal lobe, we have two gyri, the most lateral one, which runs from the basal surface of the temporal lobe to the occipital lobe, is called the lateral temporo-occipital gyrus, sometimes also referred to as the fusiform gyrus. And next to that, we have the parahippocampal gyrus. This one is sometimes also referred to as the medial temporo-occipital gyrus, but I prefer to use the name parahippocampal gyrus. Why is that? Because this medial gyrus consists of two components, one in the temporal lobe, the parahippocampal gyrus, and one in the occipital lobe, the lingual gyrus. And I believe it is easier to refer to these separate temporal and occipital gyri with their own respective names. And then what this topic is going to be all about, we have here the hippocampus. Let's also discuss the several sulci we have in the temporal lobe. We have the superior temporal sulcus between the superior and middle temporal gyrus. We have the middle temporal sulcus between the middle and inferior temporal gyrus. And lastly, we have the inferior temporal sulcus forming the border between the lateral, bay, uh, the lateral temporal uh, surface and the basal temporal surface. Between the lateral temporal occipital gyrus and the parahippocampal gyrus, we find the so-called collateral sulcus. And the collateral sulcus is a pretty important anatomical reference point. So you might want to remember that one. The collateral sulcus located here between the parahippocampal gyrus and lateral temporal occipital gyrus. So let's now evaluate the hippocampus. To evaluate a hippocampus on radiological images, we want to have images that are uh, oriented along the direction of the hippocampus. To do that, 
So we want axial and coronal images in the plane of the hippocampus and perpendicular to the hippocampus. To do that, we have to be able to recognize the hippocampus. So this is the hippocampus in a sagittal plane. These are sagittal dry D flare images. And we see here a sausage-like sausage structure with parts of the lateral ventricle seen anterior and posterior of it. And if we perform an axial T2-weighted image along the plane of this sausage here, we have a very, very nice uh, image of both hippocampi and the axial plane. If we then perform a coronal T2-weighted image perpendicular to the orientation of the sausage, we get a perfect alignment of the hippocampi and the coronal plane and a very nice illustration of hippocampal anatomy. Let's study hippocampal anatomy in a bit more detail now. So once again, we return to the axial plane and uh, these are my hippocampi and this is my submucosal retention kist in the left maxillary sinus. And when we zoom in on the right hippocampus, we can discern the various components of the hippocampus. A hippocampus is composed of anteriorly a head. Then in the middle, we have a pretty large body, which makes up most of the hippocampus. And lastly, we have at the end, a tail. Now, does anyone see the resemblance between these two structures? I have to be honest, I do not really see it. This is the hippocampus in an axial plane. As you know, hippocampus is the Greek word for seahorse. But this sausage looks very little like a seahorse, if you ask me. Where does the name come from? The name was given by anatomists who examined the structure, and I believe the name comes from the 16th or 17th century, but I'm not sure. And these anatomists looked at pathological or anatomical specimens in the axial plate. And if you look at the structure, the anatomical hippocampus, you get this configuration. And now the resemblance is, I believe, more clear. We have a structure that looks a lot like a seahorse with a head, a body, and even a very nice tail that looks a lot like the curved tail of this little yellow body here. So let's study hippocampal anatomy and the coronal plane. This is a coronal T2-weighted image centered at the level of the hippocampal head. Let's zoom in a little. How can you recognize that this is the hippocampal head? Because the hippocampal head, except in pathological cases, on the, pa on the hippocampal head, you will always be able to recognize two or three small digitations, which are called the pes hippocampi or the hippocampal feet. On top of the hippocampal head, we see part of the uncus and we see a lot of gray matter here. And what is this? What do we see here? That is the posterior part of the amygdala. The amygdala, as you know, is also part of the limbic system and plays an important role in emotion regulation and processing, especially fear. Let's slice, uh, let's examine our slices a bit more posteriorly. Then we come at the level of the hippocampal body. Let's zoom in a little bit. And how do we recognize the hippocampal body and the coronal plane? The hippocampal body has what is sometimes referred to as a Swiss roll appearance. The hippocampal body consists of two gray matter structures that are basically rolled in or folded in along each other, giving them this very characteristic appearance. Now, this is the hippocampus proper. So this is the outer cortical layer. And then the second cortical layer draped around the medial innermost part of the hippocampus proper is called the dentate gyrus. So these are the two components of the hippocampus. Then we see a very small gray matter structure 
on top of that, bordering the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. Let's remove it. Yeah, you see it here. This is the lateral horn of the temporal ventricle. What is that? That is the tail of the caudate nucleus. Here we see the head of the caudate nucleus, and the caudate nucleus, part of the basal ganglia, is a C-shaped structure which follows and runs along the wall of the lateral ventricle. So it rolls to the back and then follows the temporal horn back to the front of the brain, and that's where we find the tail of the caudate. And this is a Swiss roll, and I believe the similarity is pretty self-evident. Some people also refer to this morphology of the hippocampus as Amen's horn, or in Latin, cornuamonis. And uh, this is a reference to the Egyptian god Amon, who had two horns, which rolled, uh, had this uh, yeah, rolled-in configuration, which looks a bit like the configuration of the hippocampus. And then we slice a little bit more to the back, we come at the level of the hippocampal tail. The hippocampal tail is a bit more blurry, so we have lost the normal anatomical distinction between the two cortical layers or gray matter layers. We can't really recognize them anymore at the level of the hippocampal tail. And at the hippocampal tail, we also see a white matter band appearing, which, det which detaches from the hippocampal tail. And this is the fornix. The fornix is a white matter structure that connects the hippocampus with the mammillary bodies. Now, this was broad hippocampal anatomy. Can we say something about cellular hippocampal anatomy on MRI images? Very little, but still something. I already told you that the hippocampus is composed of two rolls of gray matter which are folded in along each other, the cornuamonis and the dente gyrus, and these we can discern on images. This is the cornuamonis and this is the dente gyrus. Now, cellularly, the hippocampus proper or cornuamonis is composed of four areas which each have an own distinctive cellular composition and anatomy. We cannot differentiate these different sectors, which are also called the summer sectors, because Sommer was the pathologist who first described them. We cannot really distinguish those on our conventional MRI examinations, not on 1.5 Tesla or uh, 3 Tesla examination. Uh, examinations. We can only see the cornuamonis and the dentate gyrus. Here we see a new term, the subiculum. What is the subiculum? The subiculum is basically the transition area. It will probably be located here, about here on this MRI examination. And it's a transition area between the hippocampus and the neocortex. And why do we need a transition area? Because the hippocampus is not neocortex. As you know, the neocortex is composed of six layers. The hippocampus is allocortex and only composed of three cellular layers. The subiculum is a transi transition area composed of four to five cellular layers. And what do these layers and the hippocampus consist of? Well, we have two gray matter rolls. We have the dentate gyrus. And in the dentate gyrus, we mainly find granule cells, which are very, very tiny neurons. These are basically the smallest neuronal cells in the brain. And these are especially abundant in another uh, structure of the brain, the cerebellum. And the fact that the cerebellum mainly contains granule cells, which are very tiny cells, is also the reason that the cerebellum contains more neurons than the cerebral hemispheres, because these neurons are these very tiny granule cells. In the hippocampus proper, the main neuronal cell type are pyramidal cells. Pyramidal cells, pyramid shapes, or cells which are also found and the pre-central gyrus. And what is uh, characteristic for pyramidal cells is, well, the cell is pyramidal shaped. 
and they are multipolar cells which have a lot of dendrites, uh, dendrites on both surfaces of the cell. They have basal dendrites and they have apical dendrites. And then they also have one very long axon, self-evidently. Now, if we study hippocampal anatomy in more detail, we cannot distinguish the various summer sectors on a tri-Tesla MRI, but there is something else we can recognize and we will practically always see on a dry tesla examination, and that is this T2 hypo-intense band. Even more, I want to see that hypo-intense band on a dry tesla examination. If I don't see it, and there is no motion artifact, or uh, it's, a uh, it's a technical perfect exam, I'm going to wonder, is something wrong here? Is this edema, or is this a mesial temporal sclerosis? So I want to see it on tri Tesla. On 1.5 Tesla, it can be blurry, so it's not abnormal to not be able to see it on 1.5 Tesla. But what is it? Well, that has been described in this study, this study by How et al., published in the American Journal of Neuroradiology in 2010. And it's a very nice study, uh, so I can advise you all to read it, but I'm going to summarize it for you. The authors examined the anatomy of the hippocampus on dry Tesla MRI, but also on pathological specimens. And they found out that this T2 hypointense band correlates to a specific layer in the uh, hippocampus proper, namely the stratum lacunosum et moleculari, and it really rolls off your tongue. And it's Try to memorize that because if you're ever in a neurological, uh, in a meeting with your fellow neurologist and you have to describe some hippocampal pathology, it's always very impressive if you're able to say something like, well, I cannot see the T2 hypointense band of the stratum lacunosum et moleculari. They're really going to be in awe when you do that. Of course, they might ask you, what does that mean? What is this stratum lacunosum et moleculari? Well, let's examine cellular anatomy of the hippocampus in a bit more detail. So this is a primitive drawing made in MS Paint. That's a pretty old drawing before I discovered the possibilities of PowerPoint, but I decided to keep it uh, out of nostalgic reasons, I believe. And here we see the yeah, the structure of a, of a pyramidal cell, which are located in the stratum pyramidale. Here we find all the pyramidal cells. And as I told you, the pyramidal cells have a lot of dendrites. They have dendrites on the apical surface and on the basal surface of the cells. Here we see the basal dendrites, which are gathered here in the stratum oriens. Then we have mainly the pyramidal cell bodies in the stratum pyramidale. Then we have a very long apical dendrite, which has uh, some side branches, and the stratum radiatum. And at the end, we get a whole lot of dendritic end branches, but really a lot. My drawing is underestimating it, which makes this stratum lacunosum et moleculari very compact and composed of a lot of myelinated tissue. And as we know, Myelinated white matter is hypointense on T2 weighted images and hyperintense on T1 weighted images. So basically, this whole bunch of myelinated dendritic end branches and the stratum lacunosum et moleculari are responsible for this T2 hypointense band discernible on tri Tesla MRIs of the brain. Now, to complete our cellular anatomy of the hippocampus proper, we also have axons, one axon per pyramidal cell. And these axons gather on top of the hippocampus where they form a white matter layer called the alveus. And the alveus is also something we can see on MRI studies. So this is a pathological specimen. This is a uh, tri-Tesla MRI examination. This is another one. I windowed it a bit more. So that makes the image a bit uh, maybe ugly to look at, but I wanted to have a lot of contrast in the image. So you would be able to see very clearly the alveus. The alveus is 
asset the white white matter eh? uh, the collected white matter tracts or the collected axons of the pyramidal cells which form a rim of white matter on top of the hippocampus and which can be seen here as a t2 hypo intense band on the hippocampal surface uh, and yep this is still the alveus and this white matter thickens at the medial end of the hippocampus and this thickening is called the fimbria this is basically the thickening of the white matter bundles of the alveus medially of the hippocampus and it is the fimbria who will thicken at the end of the hippocampal tail detach and form the legs of the fornishes this is once again the hippocampus and the sagittal plane we see a sausage we see a thin rim of a t1 hypo hyper intense matter on top of the hippocampus and this is the alveus myelinated white matter is hyper intense on t1 weighted images so we can see it also here on this sagittal t1 weighted image uh, let's talk a little bit more about the white matter of the alveus and the fimbria we are here looking at the hippocampal bodies let's uh, follow them a bit to the back of the brain we are nearing the level of the hippocampal tail and take a close look at what the fimbria here will do when we go completely to the back of the hippocampal tail we will finally get detachment of the fimbria and they will thicken and form the leg of the fornix. These two fornishes will meet one another on the undersurface of the splenium of the corpus callosum, where they are connected by a small commissure called the hippocampal commissure, which is not really visible on imaging, but can be suspected. Then the morphology of the hippocampus. On this upper uh, image here, we see two normal hippocampi. We already are able to recognize the inner structure of the hippocampus. That's good. And look at the morphology and compare with the morphology of this hippocampus or these two hippocampi. There's a difference. How would you describe the difference? Well, if we look at this hippocampus, we would say it is pretty wide, but not so tall right and it has a bit of an ovoid shape i would say if you look at this hippocampus it has a more globular shape and it is about as wide as it is tall so we have wide equals tall shape and a bit globular morphologically what is this this is called an incomplete hippocampal inversion and it's basically a variation of the normal hippocampal shape how do you get it and what does it mean does it signify anything to understand how you get this variant you have to understand a bit how the hippocampus develops embryologically embryologically you don't start with two folded in matters of gray uh, of cortex you start with one plate so embryologically you have a hippocampal plate which contains the dentate gyrus, the hippocampus proper, subiculum, and parahippocampal gyrus. And then at some point, this plate starts folding in. It folds in once, it folds in twice, until we get the typical morphology of the hippocampus as we know it from our radiological studies. Now imagine that this folding process is arrested halfway through here. So the hippocampus started folding in, but hasn't been able to roll over completely as it would have if this process wasn't interrupted. Well, then you would probably get a shape like this, in which the hippocampus is tall equals wide, is, uh, as tall as it is wide, has a bit of a rounded uh morphology but the signal intensity is normal the inner structure of the hippocampus is normal also something we can see here is uh, the collateral sulcus which has an abnormal orientation normally in a normal hippocampus the collateral sulcus can always be found underneath the hippocampus and runs a bit 
parallel with uh, the hippocampus. Yeah, it runs yeah, pretty parallel, actually. In an incomplete inversion, the collateral sulcus is located lateral of the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is completely medial of the collateral sulcus, and it runs perpendicular to the hippocampus. Now, question one is answered, and only to illustrate it, and because I found this a very beautiful study, this is a study from the American Journal of Neuroradiology, uh, 1979, Embryology of the Human Fetal Hippocampus on MRI. These are MRIs performed in fetal specimens. And at 14 weeks, we can actually see that the hippocampus is nothing but a plate. This is the parahippocampal gyrus, and this G is a germinal matrix, which is very thick and extensive at this stage of development. When an MRI is performed at uh, 16 weeks, so two weeks later, this is of course a different fetus, uh, we see that something has changed. The hippocampal plate has moved and is now located no longer medial, but a lateral of the parahippocampal gyrus. And maybe it starts folding in a little bit ready here at the top, a little bit. And then at 18 weeks, we have a folded in hippocampus with a morphology that is very similar to that seen in adult patients. So a visualization of the development of the hippocampus in fetuses. And uh, a very nice study for those of you who love embryology and anatomy. Now, what does this mean? Well, that's a more difficult one, but I think I can answer it very shortly for you. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it means very little. So that's that. There are several studies out there, but they are not so easy to compare and they contradict one another a little bit. So I'm not going to summarize them in detail. The problem is that the study populations are pretty heterogeneous and that the authors of these studies sometimes use slightly different definitions for what is an incomplete hippocampal inversion, and it makes these studies difficult to compare with one another. The prevalences vary considerably, and an incomplete inversion has been described in epilepsy patients in 6 to 40 percent of epilepsy patients, epilepsy of all kinds. It has been described in 6 to 23 percent of the general population, which is a lot, especially here, the upper limit, 23 percent. And it has been described in about 28 percent of patients with congenital malformations. So what to make of that? So it's described in a lot of epilepsy patients and patients with congenital malformations, but also in a significant part of the general population. It's probably a morphological variant. Something went wrong during the normal development of the hippocampus, arresting the uh, infolding of the hippocampal plate. This is probably nothing but a morphological variant, which has no real pathological consequences, but is a sign that maybe something went wrong. It can be seen in the general population, had no further consequences. It's also present in patients with epilepsy, and these might harbor other possibly microscopic lesions or abnormalities uh, of which the incomplete inversion is only a manifestation, but it's no causative epileptogenic lesion. And it is also seen in congenital brain disorder. And that makes the most sense, I believe, because if you have a congenital brain malformation, well, something went wrong during the embryological development of your brain, right? So it's not that unexpected to then also see an incomplete hippocampal inversion. In patients with congenital brain disorders, this incomplete inversion is often bilateral, as we can see here. And this patient with septo-optic dysplasia, there is no septum pellucidum in this patient. And we see two round hippocampi with a globular shape. And this is a patient with a complete callosal agenesis. Uh, we see the typical uh, moose sign on these coronal images. And we see two round hippocampi indicative of incomplete hippocampal inversions. When you see an incomplete inversion in an asymptomatic patient with no epilepsy, no other abnormalities, no malformations, it's generally unilateral and almost always located on the left side. Why is a bit unclear, 
but that's what it is. That's also what I see in daily clinical practice. And that's also what's described in the literature. To find one on the right side, unilateral is actually rather exceptional. So what else can we tell about embryology of the hippocampus and variants of the hippocampus? During embryological development, there exists a hippocampal sulcus, which gets obliterated when the hippocampus has completely developed and has this com and has completely folded in. So here we can see the hippocampal sulcus and we can see that as the hippocampus folds in more and more, this gets obliterated, but sometimes you can have a very small remnant lateral of the dentate gyrus located between the dentate gyrus and the hippocampus proper. And we can see this, this here and here can sometimes have the appearance of cysts and we call those hippocampal remnant cysts or hippocampal sulcus cysts or hippocampal sulcal remnant cysts, whatever. The most important thing is that you know that these are benign and or actually to be ignored. They have no pathological or clinical significance. And this is the hippocampal sulcus drawn on these images. So we're almost finished for our first session of the hippocampus. Maybe a short word on the function of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is part of the limbic system. And the limbic system is basically a collection of structures which are phylogenetically a bit older. They have developed earlier during the evolutionary process than, let's say, our cerebral neocortex. They're located in the midline and uh, have an arch-like or C-shaped structure. And they are involved in older evolutionary important functions such as emotion, smell, and memory. Uh, they are described in three anatomical arches. We have an outer arch consisting of the parahippocampal gyrus, which is connected with the gray and white matter of the cingulum and subcalosal gyrus. We have a middle layer of which the hippocampus is part, and the hippocampus continues in a very, very small layer of gray matter situated on top of the corpus callosum called the indusium grisium, which is uh, radiologically not visible because it is so thin, and which is in continuity with, eventually, the olfactory bulb, the olfactory bulb, which also connects to the mesial temporal structures. And then lastly, oops, we have an inner layer, which consists of the white matter of the alveus and fimbria, which form the fornix, and the fornix connects the hippocampus with the mammillary bodies. Now, lastly, we have various other gray matter structures, such as the amygdala, involved in fear, the hypothalamus, involved in several autonomic functions, and we have several thalamic nuclei that are also part of the limbic system, and the mammalothalamic tract connecting the mammillary bodies with the anterior thalamic nuclei. A final word on the function of the hippocampus. How was it discovered that the hippocampus is as important as it is? Well, basically by accident, unfortunately. We see here the picture of a young man, Henry Malaysen, who is uh, better known as patient HM in the psychological literature. And patient HM, or Henry Malaysen, is probably the most studied patient in the history of psychology. Uh, Henry suffered from severe epilepsy as a child and a young adult, and his epilepsy made it impossible for him to have a normal life. So he consulted a neurosurgeon, and at the time, neurosurgeons were gradually finding out that the hippocampus can be an important source of epileptic seizures. And this surgeon, William Beecher Scoville, suggested to remove both hippocampi in Henry Malaysen. That was done. And the surgery was a success. No major complications, that is to say, no typical surgical complications. And the patient was seizure free following the surgery, but he also suffered from amnesia. He had a retrograde amnesia for like the two years leading up to the surgery, but he had excellent memory of uh, his childhood and so on. And 
more importantly, he had anterograde amnesia. He was no longer able to form new memories. He was no longer able to develop or consolidate his memories and long-term memory. So he only had a short-term memory and lived in a continuous present which lasted about 30 seconds or so, uh, which is very hard for us to imagine how that must feel. Um, so basically a bit of a tragic story, but also a story that for the first time pointed out the incredible functional importance of the hippocampus and its role in memory. And that concludes our first session on the hippocampus. This will be follow up by another session on the hippocampal anatomy, one part on ac acute hippocampal diseases and one on chronic hippocampal diseases. So I hope to see you then. If you have any feedback on this session, please leave a message or send me an email or so. Thank you very much.